on the way in, I met uh, Suri Vansa and he said, have you got your stick to beat people? <laughs> uh, Shantiketu had said something similar to me earlier, that uh, I don't really need to give a talk, I just need to beat people. <laughs> because Hakuin has a reputation, not totally deserved, although not totally undeserved, um, of being very strict. And he did beat people, I believe. And there's a picture here I've got of him, and there's a, the same picture on the shrine. I'll pass this round later on, and you can see his stick, and it's a pretty thick, <laughs> solid one. Yeah. So, what I'd like you to do, first of all, is to close your eyes, if you like to, because we're going to do a bit of imagining. If you have a thing about closing your eyes, then there's no rules here, but I find it easy. So I'd just like you to imagine you're on a beach, a nice sand beach. You're probably about six or seven, so you're a child on a beach, you're enjoying yourself, you're watching the waves coming and going up to the shore and back again and you're watching the clouds as gently as they're passing by and you're playing in the sand maybe kicking it with your feet or whatever and maybe you've made a sand castle and you've enjoyed doing that and then a wave comes along as waves do and it swishes the sand around the sand castle <clears throat> so some of it falls down now you might just think oh well that's a pity I'll do another one tomorrow and go off and do something else kick some more sand or something or you might just feel a little bit sad and distressed about it because you realize that actually that sand castle will never happen again and that the waves that are coming will never be the same again and the clouds that are passing are changing all the time and even the people in your life are changing all the, li all the time your mother, your father and then you realize actually everything is changing all the time there's quite a strong sense of you, even as a small child, of impermanence. And so interesting as this is in some ways, it also means that at some point you'll die and your parents will die. And this may be engenders in you quite a sense of sadness and maybe of helplessness too. So just feel being that child. And then another image, another bit of imagining. You, you're about 11 by now, 11 or 12, <clears throat> and your mother is quite religious. And so she's taken you off. You're in Japan. She's taken you off to a preacher a Japanese Buddhist preacher because uh, she's keen to hear what he has to say and actually what he has to say is about the eight hot hells he's talking about the realms but he's focusing, he's featuring the eight hot hells and you may not have come across these before or if you have it hasn't really dawned on you what that's about but actually it terrifies you these hells that people descend into after death. You've got a big imagination and you're really frightened. You just feel how that is. So as you grow a little bit more, it, you keep on being haunted by the sense of these hells and what happens after death. And you wonder how you can avoid it. 
And you have heard that some Buddhist priests do a lot of chanting and praying and various other actions and it helps them to develop so they can avoid falling into these hells when they die. So you have a go at that. So you start being quite ascetic in a way, and rising very early, reciting sutras over and over and over, dousing yourself with really cold water, even in the winter. And you try prostrations too. But actually, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Your fears don't go away. You're still unsure of how to avoid dying the whole cycle of birth and death. And you think maybe it's because there's so many distractions of living at home that you can't focus enough on working with yourself. So you think, well, I'd better go into the temple. I'd better go and be a monk. See if that will <clears throat> make a difference because I, at least I can then have a quiet, strict life. And if, if Buddhist monks and priests can do it, that's the way I should go. So you do. You join the monastery. You go to the local temple. You had to persuade your parents. They didn't really want you to go. But they've let you. In fact, your hopes are very quickly dashed. So... You can open your eyes now and close them. And just stop for a moment and just notice how you feel. You're no longer a young Japanese boy. But I hope you've got some sort of sense of Hakuin, because that's, of course, who we're talking about. In fact, at that time, he was called Iwajiro. Irajiro. Um, and... Later on, he became a Zen master, the foremost um, practitioner in Japan, and he became enlightened. So, in the next um, half an hour, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. Um, first of all, i just give you a bit of context, um, because a lot of the uh, ancient... Uh, Enlightened beings, we talk, well, the enlightened, are, are, they're often quite ancient. Actually, he didn't live very long ago. He lived about 250 years ago. So he was born in 1686 and he died in 1768. And that's well um, clarified. Um, and he was born in Japan. Japan at that time was actually fairly prosperous. And it was a fairly settled country. Um, I think it would have been unsafe to go out at night, particularly out of the cities, but it was okay around in the daytime. And, and there weren't big uprisings or anything at that point. There were lots of, so there were lots of monks, lots of temples, lots of rituals and things being done. There were natural disasters though. Mount Fuji erupted. That's the last time Mount Fuji erupted, but it was a huge eruption. And it swept away lots of villages, including some quite near where Hakuin lived, because he lived not far from Mount, uh, Mount Fuji. And there was also around that time um, a huge earthquake and tsunami, uh, resulting in fires and floods on the east coast, much where the one was that happened a few months ago. So in some ways things haven't changed. Um, and just to kind of put it in context, what was happening in Scotland at that time? Well, the Act of Union was 1707. So uh, Hakuin was about um, 20 around that time. Um, the Jacobite Rebellion, 1715. Bonnie Prince Charlie, Culloden, 1745-1746. So it was that kind of period in Scotland <coughs> when um, he was living and growing in Japan. And actually, when I was thinking about this, it, it did make me think that 
Yeah, there were disasters in both places. They were man-made disasters in Scotland. The land mass as such was fairly stable. We didn't have any earthquakes or anything. But there was a lot of fighting. But in Japan, although there wasn't much fighting, there were natural disasters. So I can't seem to avoid them. So what was she like, this boy who was frightened? He was terrified of the hot coals. Well, I'm going to give you three short snapshots. I thought rather than kind of just going through it all, I'm just kind of pinpoint three periods of his life. Um, and the, the child one, we hopefully you've got some sense of already. He was very imaginative. He was very intelligent. He was very fearful. He was quite self-willed. No, I think he was probably very self-willed, actually. Um, he was the youngest child of five, and I think he was quite special to his mother. So I think letting him go and live in the temple was quite hard for her. Um, she was also quite religious, so there was quite a religious background in the house. Um, and this business, yeah, being haunted by hells and by how to save himself, how to avoid, really, the whole cycle of life and death. It was the lack of security of the sense that he had, and really the sense of no nothing, no thing to cling to. So that was him as a child up to about, um, well, he goes into the monastery at 15, I think, 14 or 15. So here's the next snapshot. In, as a young man, perhaps in his twenties, he went into the uh, temple and um, <clears throat> he thought, as I said, it would be great, but actually he found it wasn't. But he was really single-minded going in there, that really wanted to find the way beyond birth and death. He was kind of really focused. But he did have highs and lows, I suspect. His highs were very high and his lows were very low, so he might not have been the easiest person to be around all the time. Um, he did get very disillusioned both with himself at times, and I'll talk a bit about that later, but also with the monks, who he didn't, they didn't live up to his expectations at all. But he searched out good teachers, he went from one to another, really looking for people that he felt could help him. And he was absolutely devoted to his practice in a quite an austere and uncompromising way. So here's this young man of kind of 20-something, and he's really going for it. Um, and he was very scathing of what he called do-nothing priests. Um, yeah, I'll come to that again later. But, so he could be mm, not... Too nice to be around at times, I suspect. Um, he looked. There's a picture of him on the shrine, and there's another picture of him here. It's a self-portrait, although actually this one is taken. Taken. This is his self-portrait. He did, um, in fact, when he was quite old. Um, but he reputedly had very round eyes, which is quite unusual for Japanese. And he had big, bushy eyebrows. Um, and he was a big, strong kind of fellow. Although, when I was talking about this with Santa Kato, it, it occurred to me, when I was in Japan, I think, and I'm quite small, I stood at least half a head higher than anybody else if I was strap hanging in a train. Um, so I think big and big is perhaps a comparative term. Yes. Uh, but it said he moved like a bull and he glared like a tiger. So um, he had a large face and staring eyes. So and that's how he's uh, portrayed himself. So I'll pass this around. You can just look at it as I'm talking if you like. Um, yeah, so even in his 20s, uh, he did have a series of insights. So he did develop, deepen his practice really quite quickly. Um, and he used koans, which I'll come back to. 
So that was him as a young man, strong, dedicated, keen, didn't suffer fools gladly or at all, um, but really searching really hard. And then here's the third snapshot, and actually the, the visual image of him is more like the picture that's going around and picture that's on the shrine. Um, by the, his, in his sixties, then, he had attained what was called the Great Satori, which is enlightenment in our terms, and he was recognized as having done so. He was very much the foremost teacher in Japan, and he attracted disciples hugely, even though they put up with an awful lot when they were around him. And I'll read you a quote about that later on. Um, he had at one point decided uh, to learn calligraphy and painting. It was at one of his disillusioned times. And, and he was quite fated for being a really um, good calligrapher. And actually the writing on that will be his. Um, so also when he was older, yeah, he also wrote poetry, a lot of poetry, and he painted and he wrote books. And he was very keen to teach all and sundry, not just the monks. He was, in fact, really trying to fulfill his bodhisattva vow vows, which he'd taken when he was ordained. Bodhisattva vows to save all beings. Really big. But he was really trying to fulfill it. So those are three snapshots of him. As a child, as a young man, as an old man. Um, and how do we know? Well, he wrote many books. Uh, he wrote a spiritual autobiography, <coughs> which actually I brought with me, which is, it was quite unusual, because mostly books people wrote in those days were to do with the techniques, or, or else they were sutras, or um, about sutras. And he also had a biography uh, written about him by one of his disciples called Torre. Um, so there's there's plenty that we know about him. I suppose that's one of the benefits of him living not that long ago. So, what was his path to enlightenment? A great awakening, Satori, whatever you call it. Well, he was ordained within the Rinzai school of Zen. Um, not all Buddhism in Japan. Japan is Zen. We tend to think of it as it is, but it's not, in fact. But he was within the Zen tradition, which is part of the Mahayana. Um, and Zen is really difficult to describe. It's impossible to describe. So I was thinking, how can I describe it if it's impossible to describe? Um, so we could just sit here now. And you could experience it, but um, I turned to Bhante Sangharachar's writing, see what he said about it, and he said, oh, it's very elusive, it's very difficult to describe. <laughs> so I thought, oh, yeah, right. Um, but he did give a few characteristics. So characteristics of Zen are, one, that the sacred and the everyday are not distinct. So you don't, you don't have, you don't be holy in inverted commas, if you know what I mean. Everything is all about living, about being. Um, and you wouldn't probably have a whole lot of... Um, oh, that, there's a message for having it over there. So we probably wouldn't have rupas, well, we definitely wouldn't have rupas and badgers on the shrine if this was a Zen temple. Um, another characteristic, Bandy says, is about um, concrete illustrations rather than universal principles. And actually, as I was listening to the poem being read, which really covers more or less the whole basic dharma, it, but it's really clear and, um, although it's really profound teaching, it it, there are examples in it. It's not just about, it's not philosophy. Right? And um, 
the third characteristic that he names is about action rather than abstraction. Well, that's part of what I say. Both on and off the cushion. So you live your whole life. And then it's not first this and then that. So another, um, I looked at Suzuki, who's a foremost um, Zen writer, and he said, the basic idea of Zen is to come in touch with the inner workings of our being, and to do this in the most direct way possible, without resorting to anything external or super-added. So this is what Hakuin was trying to do. He was training his mind. He was trying to see into his own nature. That was his aim. Um, and that's what he was really persistent with. So just a wee bit more about his background in the temple. There's two main schools of Zen, um, which you may know. One of them is Soto, and um, uh, next week we're going to have something about Dogen, who actually founded the Soto school. And the other school, the main one we're talking about, is Rinzai, which is uh, the one that Hakuin belonged to and rejuvenated. And that focuses on opening minds through the use of koans. Now, what are koans? Koans are things that we use the term around, but actually, what are they? Well, and what's the point of them? They're um, questions or propositions that can only be resolved by going beyond logic and leaping to another level of comprehension. So they might sound absurd or nonsensical or stupid or maybe straightforward, but actually the aim is to, to actually let us doubt what we're thinking to open into a, a deeper way of being and um, really shaking us up. So we're looking at things from a deeper point of view, not just from um, ordinary, everyday kind of, not thinking things are substantial or permanent when they're not, which we do all the time, even though we know in our heads they're not. So, um, I thought you might like an example or two of the Cohen's. These were ones that Hakuin used too, by the way. Um, there was one, does a dog have Buddha nature? And the answer is, <laughs> no, nothing. That means nothing or no thing. That's something for you to think about. Um, another one, what is the ultimate principle of Buddhism? The cypress tree in the courtyard. And here's one that actually he invented and he used a lot with his students. And I thought, well, maybe we just, I'll just read it to you and we'll just have a moment or two for you actually just to let it sink in. You've probably heard it before. And just see how you feel, what happens, basically. So that, this one is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? What is the sound of one hand clapping? Can you just ponder this for a moment. See where your mind takes you. What is the sound of one hand clapping? And I hope some of you at least got a bit cross when I asked you to think about that. I hope it kind of made you a bit irritable or impatient maybe. Because that's the aim of them. That's The aim is to go beyond what you can immediately see, feel, think, touch, what you're used to. So you take that home and think about it when you're lying in the bath or something, see where you get to. I think that, was that another bit of um, ice melting? That's good. Um, somebody said to me they could hear it plopping 
all the time during the meditation. So that's the aim of it to melt. Okay, so here was Hakuin. We've got him as a young man in the monastery. He learnt classical Chinese, so he could read the scriptures. He was he read the Lotus Sutra, in fact, and he wasn't initially very interested in it. He thought it was just a series of stories, not up to much. In fact, later on, it was when he was reading that that he did actually gain enlightenment. But that's many years later. So when he first was in a monastery, he was really horrified at so many what he called do-nothing monks. Um, probably a lot of them went into the monastery because it was a thing to do, and it was a relatively easy life, and why not? Um, otherwise you'd probably be laboring in the fields. Or... So um, I suspect that there were quite a lot of monks in that. There's also quite a lot of monks who, um, because there was this sense uh, that people were already Buddhas, there was nothing to gain, there was a sense of complacency, they didn't do anything. Now, again, the beginning of that poem says, all beings in the very beginning are Buddhas. Actually, it doesn't mean it quite straightforwardly like right that. In a way it does. Anyway, so he, uh, Hakuin, saw not very much of the monks and he talked about them as doing nothing but sitting lifelessly like wooden blocks. And all beings from the very beginning are Buddhas but living in the world of illusion. So the ice and the uh, water there I suppose, in a way, there's a there's a sense of ice and water. There's nothing added and nothing taken away, but ice is rigid, and maybe if we're seeing narrowly, we don't have the expansiveness that flowing water does. There's a whole lot of ways you can take that, but that's perhaps one of them. And so these monks were sitting quite happily in the temple, as far as Hakuin could see, and he wasn't, he didn't think they were up to much. And no doubt said so. He was, in fact, he was quite scathing. <clears throat> um, he said they were taking food and money from the local people, uh, because in those days people gave things, to, well it still happens in, uh, in fact, uh, give food and money to the temple, and then they hope the monks will uh, become enlightened and the people by giving will gain merit and perhaps have a better rebirth. But uh, Hakuin actually said, no, you're thieves to the monks because you're actually taking from the people but you're not doing what they think you're doing. So, so he was quite outspoken, I think, even when he was quite young. Um, but gradually, over the years, he became um, really an immense figure, physically and spiritually. Um, very influential, <coughs> setting an example of this great burning tenacity of purpose. Um, and he did live in the same temple that he went back to after he'd been wandering around a lot. He went back eventually and stayed there for 50 years. And it was just a little old place he went to. But gradually people were attracted and they came and they came. Um, and so there were lots, um, hundreds of monks eventually. And I'll just read you what it says because it makes you realize just um, as he was older, now and I'm talking of uh, after he was about 40 or so, what an immense... Uh, presence he had um, and he did apparently gain enlightenment when he was about 41 but before that he had a whole lot of insights gradually they gradually it wasn't like one day he was just scrabbling around in the dirt and the next day he was in um, there was a whole series of insights mostly 
from uh, using this Cohen method um, so that although it might seem that it's sudden it's it's been built up the uh, development of his practice so there he is he's an older man now and uh, he's got lots of monks who are really feeling um, oh this man's got something that maybe we really want to be near him and we want to learn from him and they must have really wanted to because listen to this they took shelter in old houses and abandoned dwellings in ancient temple halls and ruined shrines their lodgings were spread over an area five or six leagues around Shorinji, that's his temple hunger awaited them in the morning freezing cold lurked for them at night they sustained themselves on greens and wheat chuff. Their ears were assaulted by the master's deafening shouts and abuse. Their bones were hammered by furious blows from his fists and stick. What they saw furrowed their foreheads in disbelief. What they heard bathed their bodies in cold sweat. There were scenes a demon would have wept to see. Sights that would have moved a devil to press his palms together in pious supplication. And would a single one of these monks have remained at Shoinji, even a moment, if he had not been totally devoted to his quest, grudging neither his health nor life itself? So from finding all these lazy monks, as he saw them when he first went into the temple, his gradual increasing influence uh, was tremendous. Tremendous. But he did have setbacks. It didn't all go straight forward me. He did have a series of setbacks uh, when he became disillusioned um, or ill. Um, and it was actually on the first time he went in when he was really disillusioned with them and thought they were all sitting around doing nothing much and behaving like pieces of wood that um, he decided he would learn calligraphy and painting oh yes um, what had happened when he was at first a new monk, uh, there was a great practitioner called Yen Tao who had been killed and he'd actually been killed by robbers in his temple, he just sat in the temple and the robbers had come and when he just sat when they wanted money they just ran him through with their swords and so on and killed him. And this was a big shock for Hakuin because Hakuin thought if, if such a great man can die just like that, what hope is there for a mere monk like me and he was probably still in his teens at this point and he says a buddhist monk had to be the most useless creature on the face of the earth how i rue the day i let them shave my hair off look at me a sorry wretched looking outcast i can't possibly return to my lay life i'd be too ashamed and so he decided uh, he thought he might as well um, do something instead of wasting the rest of his life. So at that point, if it wasn't going to be a monk, he might as well become a calligrapher and a poet and so on. So that's how that started. Um, and I like that little bit because it's, this is his autobiography and it's just written in a really kind of uh, readable kind of way. Look at me, a sorry, wretched looking outcast. But I can't possibly return to lay life. I'd be too ashamed. So yeah, it's interesting that he would admit that. So that was the setback. And what he did from it was actually start to learn other things. Then, um, um, yes, he also um, had come across a book at one point, just when he needed it, and it was called Spurring Students Through the Zen Barrier. 
And when I read that, it made me think of all these do-it-yourself health books that are on the shelves in the Waterstones. It sounds a bit like that, doesn't it? Anyway, it was obviously very good because he kept it with him for many years. And it had just come to him just at the right time. It was literally, there were some books laid out. They were airing the books when the sun was shining. And he just picked one up. And it happened to be spurring students through the Zen marriage. So, um, <clears throat> and I was thinking, well, actually, things happening just at the right time, they do, don't they? I mean, I, I know I walked past this building for about seven or eight years quite regularly. I never even noticed the front door. But it was, yeah, I can see a few nods around the place. But actually, it was just that I really needed it. It was just at that moment that, oh, so I think that does happen to us. So for him, luckily, it was this particular book. Um, at another point, thinking about setbacks again, so the setback, this spurring the students helped. But um, at another point, he became quite ill. This was a bit later on. Um, he quite, became quite ill with what he called Zen sickness. And I'll just read you what he puts. Because I think this also um, shows his character quite a lot. Okay. On the day I first committed myself to a life of Zen practice, I pledged to summon all the faith and courage at my command and dedicate myself with steadfast resolve to the pursuit of the Buddha way. I embarked on a regimen of rigorous austerities, which I continued for several years, pushing myself relentlessly. Well, we know that. Then one night, everything suddenly fell away, and I crossed the threshold into insight. Uh, Satori, was it? All the doubts and uncertainties that had burdened me all those years suddenly vanished, roots and all, just like melted ice. Deep-rooted karma that had bound me for endless kalpas to the cycle of birth and death vanished like foam on the water. It's true, I thought to myself, the way is not far from man. Those stories about the ancient masters taking 20 or even 30 years to attain it, someone must have made them all up. For the next several months, I was waltzing on air, flagging my arms and stamping my feet in a kind of witless rapture. After, you can imagine it, can't you? Witless rapture, that's it. Afterwards, however, as I began reflecting upon my everyday behaviour, I could see that the two aspects of my life the active and the meditative, were totally out of balance. No matter what I was doing, I never felt free or completely at ease. I realised I would have to rekindle a fearless resolve and once again throw myself life and limb together into the Dharma struggle, with my teeth clenched tightly and eyes focused straight ahead. He's got those big... I began devoting myself single-mindedly to my practice, forsaking food and sleep altogether. Before the month was out, my heart fire began to rise upwards against the natural course, parching my lungs of their essential fluids. My feet and legs were always ice cold. They felt as though they were immersed in tubs of snow. There was a constant buzzing in my ears, as if I were walking beside a raging mountain torrent. I became abnormally weak and timid, shrinking and fearful in whatever I did. I felt totally drained, physically and mentally exhausted. Strange visions appeared to me during waking and sleeping hours alike. My armpits were always wet with perspiration. My eyes watered constantly. I travelled far and wide visiting wise Zen teachers, seeking out noted physicians, but none of the remedies they offered brought me any relief. So it was quite clear that the um, insights he'd had weren't complete. And 
What happened after that was, in fact, he did eventually find somebody called Haku, who taught him introspective meditation, um, and which was a more complex form of what we were actually doing earlier this evening in the meditation. And that's why I wanted you to just try. It was about, he had been talking about the heat rising. And I suppose for me, the heat rising is when I become very kind of busy in the head. So it was about letting it go right down to the soul. There was more to it than that. But basically that was um, what he found was really helpful. And I, I did think maybe all the Cohen's work had got a bit heady. Or maybe he was pushing himself too hard. Or maybe it was um, also a physical thing because it seems possible that he had diabetes. Um, he was very fond of sweets. And it, and it seems that he may have had diabetes. So maybe that was related to it too. Whatever it was, when he learnt this introspective meditation and he practiced it and he said, oh, I just practiced it every day for three years. <laughs> um, but it certainly made a huge difference. It really helped. Um, Akaku, who was another teacher, actually also said to him, just stop running. And I think that all ties in. Sounds like the Buddha with the angry Limala, doesn't it? But... Uh, I think he was perhaps really trying, pushing himself, making too much effort. So, um, yeah, Th those were the setbacks, the main setbacks he'd had, and, and that's how he dealt with them. He um, did get one or two really good teachers. One of them was called Shoju, and he actually only was with him for about eight or nine months, but it made a huge difference to him. I think Shoju was very strict with him and um, told him to stop his nonsense when he thought he was enlightened when he wasn't. Um, but he also went to teachers from any school. He didn't just stick with Rinzai, he'd go to Sotu, he, he'd go to the Nambutsu school, the Nichirens, anybody who he felt was a really good teacher who could really help him, he would go to. And actually that reminded me a bit of Banti when he was in um, India because he went to a whole range of teachers. He didn't just stick with the, um, the Theravans. So, <coughs> just a little bit more. Yeah. As I said, he was um, enlightened uh, when he was about 41, it was generally acknowledged that he had gained the great emancipation. Um, and here's a, a quote from Torre, who was one of his disciples, but also his biographer. So he said, the master lived in the state of emancipation. This is after enlightenment. The enlightening activity of the Buddhas was now, he, was now his without any lack whatsoever enabling him to speak with the same tongue and from the same lips as all the Buddhas before him. And he spent a lot of time, as he got older, writing books. Um, and there's a nice little quote I found of his. He said, the exercise of verbal pranya is what he thought of as writing. The exercise of verbal pranya. A word or two from an enlightened teacher designed to trouble later generations of students. So he's wanting to uh, not let anybody become too complacent or settle down. And again, actually, Banti has said that to us in order to talk to being disruptive. So I guess that's part of deeply our practice. So he did lots of teaching. He encouraged his students with a stick sometimes, as we heard, or cuffing them around. But really, he was really strongly um, determined that as many people as possible should experience the profound uh, depths that he had. Um, and he devised new ways to help lay people. He wasn't, interestingly, 
he wasn't just interested in monks. He was also interested in helping lay people. And um, he did have a sense that anybody could gain enlightenment. It wasn't just the monks and the lay people would hope for a, a future read, a better reader. So he uh, used quite a number of ways of drawings and um, rhymes and all sorts of things. Just And he went round and talked in villages and so on. He also uh, went round lecturing in the in the halls and the temples, and he lectured on the Lotus Sutra once he'd really decided it was worth it. Um, and the Bibliothecary Nadesha, he was uh, very influential with him. I don't know if anybody's here who uh, remembers last summer, one of the summer specials last year. I talked about the Bibliothecary Nadesha, which is quite dear to my heart too. And he also talked a lot about a thing called the Blue Cliff Record, which some of you may have heard of, which actually is a whole collection of poems. He wrote quite often in local dialects um, for local people. I imagine in that time that, as perhaps in India today, um, you can travel from village to village and people may well speak different dialects and may not even understand each other uh, at times. But anyway, he really wanted to connect with people, so he spoke whatever he needed to. So presumably he spoke a number of them. He knew understood them. And he made up nonsense poems and riddles and pictures, uh, all to convey his teaching. And it was all about seeing into your true nature. He also felt that uh, the lay people were quite up to um, developing themselves through uh, Cohen's too. And then when he, yeah, when, when, by the time he was kind of in his 60s, 70s, he died when he was 82, and until quite a short time before that, he had been going round teaching, lecturing, travelling. Pretty hard life he had, because it wouldn't be like getting on the train. Even 250 years ago, I don't know whether he rode a horse or walked. I have no idea. I don't know whether they had horses very much in Japan. Anyway, there was a phrase he used and he mulled over quite a lot. And it was a, he said, the mind of enlightenment. But to him, the mind of enlightenment was about acting as a bodhisattva. And he mulled over what that meant and he wrote, it is, I realized, a matter of doing good, benefiting others by giving them the gift of the Dharma teaching. I pledged that I would, from that moment forth, drive forward the wheel of the four great universal vows. Now I'm more than 80 years of age, but I've never been remiss in my effort to fulfill that pledge. I go wherever I'm asked, 50 or 100 leagues, it doesn't faze me in the least. I do everything I possibly can to impart the Dharma to people. And that's what he was doing when he was 80. So, why does he inspire me? Well, you can probably see my, my demeanour that he does. Um, I suppose the, the first thing is, because of his depth of practice, his determination, there's no compromise in the great matter. He was determined to um, develop himself so he was beyond the cycle of birth and death. There were no half measures with him. There was no complacency. He just got on with it. Um, though he did go through periods of doubt, but he didn't give up, and he did admit that he was wrong. Okay, I have another little bit to read you. Okay. So anyway, so that's one of the things why one of the reasons for. Uh, I suppose another reason was also his ability to balance calm and activity, which is something he really tried to focus on. Um, and just going beyond irritations, being able to move from one um, activity to another 
as a flow. And here's a bit. Zazen means to bring that force by which the Zen meditation is gripped directly to bear upon one's own present daily life to vivify it, withdrawing into meditation and then advancing and handling affairs. This advancing and withdrawing, movement and rest, together must be Zen. And that's what he was able to, through trial and error, I think he was able to do. Um, and I was thinking about how often when I talk with his land with myself is, you know, it's, oh, I really like to go on retreat, but actually I can't because I need to do this, or I need to work, or I need to look after my mum or something. So there's a tension there. Um, or even just trying to fit meditation into a working day is a tension of, the, of getting the balance. Is it, do you find difficulty getting balance? There's a few nods. Obviously, a lot of people are saying, that's good. <laughs> I, I do. But anyway, he really worked with that and was able to get the balance. Um, I, I also uh, admire him for his commit, for his the way he was uh, he worked with ordinary people, and the, he talked very much about not these actual words, but commitment being primary and lifestyle being secondary, which again is something within the order that's um, facet of it, I suppose. Um, he was concerned with ordinary people, not just monks. He could see the potential of Buddhahood in everyone and used whatever method helped them. Koans, poetry, drawings, conversations, and so on. So he really um, looked for the person rather than their station in life, if you like. And that was quite unusual in Japan at that time. Within his uh, order and within his... Um, school of Zen, Rinzai, he almost single-handedly, to begin with, reinvigorated it. I think he reinvigorated it with, perhaps by really showing people, perhaps in a fairly scathing way, what he didn't approve of. But he got monks from, he started, when he first went in the monastery, he talked about monks as clothes hangers <laughs> and rice sacks. <laughs> Um, but I don't think there were many clothes hangers or rice sacks left by the by the later on in his uh, lifetime, um, and I don't think monks any longer saw it an easy option to go into temples. Uh, they had to be prepared for his cuffs and blows, but he obviously inspired them. It's a really great effort, um, and he systematized koan teaching. He he found koan teaching so useful, and it was a bit haphazard. And he realized that from going to the various teachers. He actually systematized it within the Rinzai tradition so that uh, students could learn in a fairly regular fashion. And that was very helpful for future students. Um, I suppose I also like about how he wrote about his experience in, in this particular personal style. And <coughs> it's just full of little details which make me want to read the next page and turn over and just feel... Oh, I just feel a sense of the person from all the little kind of things that he mentions. Um, and I suppose finally, I haven't really talked about any other poetry. He did write other poetry, but the one that we have featured, if you like, tonight, um, it really touches deep parts in me. It's words, but it it has a a profound sense of wisdom beyond words that really it works for me. So let's finish with hearing it again and maybe hearing the plops of water and it's still plopping. Um, and then we'll just sit for a few minutes, just about five minutes and I'll ring the bell to end. <laughs> 